Now, before we get started with today's episode, don't forget to check out our Patreon. That's where you're going to find exclusive episodes, access to our final reports, and so much more. The link to that Patreon will be in the description box below. Also, check out our Buy Me A Coffee website if you'd like to just support the podcast a little bit. Anything will truly mean the world to me. If you're listening on YouTube, do not forget to subscribe because we are on our way to 100 subscribers now without wasting any more of your time let us get started with the episode welcome to a crash investigation the podcast the show where we dissect and discuss prominent crashes in aviation history i'm your host as always kai jordan and in today's episode we're going to be talking about china airlines flight 006 the crew the crash the investigation Without wasting any more of your time, because this probably will be a long episode. So sit back, relax, and let us get started. It is the greatest aviation mystery of all time. Lies a massive passenger jet and the remains of its 239 passengers and crew. Uh, Good morning. We have a smoke uh, uh, problem. And we're doing emergency descent to level 150. In December 1988, a passenger airliner was bombed over Scotland in what was one of the largest pre-9-11 terrorist attacks. China Airlines Flight 006 was a scheduled flight for the 19th of February 1985. Its origin would be Shanghai Shek International Airport, which is now listed as Taiwan Taoyuan International Airport in Taiwan. Sorry if I said that wrong. Its destination was Los Angeles International Airport, California, the United States of America. The aircraft used was the famous Boeing 747, and the call sign was actually Dynasty Z. Now, I did cover one episode with another dynasty, so I think China Airlines really do love this whole dynasty something to make it a little bit more royal, if you'd say. The crew, the captain of this flight was Min Yuan Ho, who was 55 years old at the time of the crash. He was qualified to fly a Boeing 747 as a captain on the 7th of May 1980. In total, he had 15,494 flight hours with 3,748 hours on the 747. His last two simulator checks were on the 14th of April 1994 and he passed both of them. His medical certificate was issued on the 4th of January 1985 and it concluded that he had to, and I quote, wear corrective glasses while exercising the privileges of his airman certificate, end quote. Now, this is very common for older pilots to need glasses. So it's not usually a factor, especially when it comes to crashes, but with this one, you probably will think the whole vision thing was a problem because that's what I also thought when I was researching this flight. The first officer of this flight was Zhu Yung Chang, who was 53 years old at the time of the crash. He was qualified to fly as the first officer on the 747 on the 31st of August 1981. He had 7,734 total flight hours with 4,553 flight hours on the 747. His medical certificate was issued on the 15th of November 1984 and it said that he had no limitations when it comes to participating in his airman duties. His last simulator proficiency tests were conducted on the 23rd of April and 23rd of November 1984 respectively and he passed both of them. His last recheck was on the 7th of June 1984. The flight engineer of this flight was Ko Pin Well, who was 55 years old at the time of the crash. He was qualified as a flight engineer on the 13th of August 1979. In total, he had 15,510 flight hours with 4,363 hours on the 747. 
His medical certificate was issued on the 17th of December 1984 and he had to wear glasses while flying. His last simulator proficiency tests were on the 26th of October 1983 and the 21st of May 1984 and he passed them both. His last two root checks were on the 9th of August and December 18th, 1984. There were two relief crew members as his flight was going to be about 11 hours. The two crew members were Captain Shen Wan Liao, who was 53, and Flight Engineer Po Che Sun Shi Lung, who was 41 years old. They were, and I quote, certified, properly held valid medical certificates and had received and passed all required flight and simulator checks. End quote. There were 251 passengers and 18 flight attendants on board. The aircraft. So the airplane, the 747, was received by China Airlines on the 29th of June 1982. This airplane was operating from that day until the China Airlines Flight 006 flight. Something happened with the number 4 engine, but we will discuss that right now. The flight. So before the flight took place, Captain Ho was made aware during the pre-flight briefing that the engine, a specific engine number four, was repaired recently by maintenance. Please keep this at the back of your head for the sake of this flight. China Airlines Flight 006 aka Dynasty 006 takes off from Chiang Kai-shek International Airport at 22 minutes past 12 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. The flight was going incredibly smooth and as this flight was cruising inside the clouds over the Pacific Ocean, the relief crew consisting of Captain Liao and Flight Engineer Lang took over. The quote-unquote original crew, which is what I like to say in order not to get confused, was scheduled to rest for five hours and then they were supposed to return back to the cockpit. However, two hours into the scheduled rest period, Captain Ho went back into the cockpit and he was essentially keeping the relief crew company instead of sleeping and resting. This is very suspicious because I think... I'm not a pilot, so please correct me if I'm wrong. I think, isn't it kind of mandatory for the original crew to rest so that they are ready to continue with the flight? Please let me know in the comments because I saw this as incredibly suspicious. But let's move on. At this point, the airplane is reaching Los Angeles and the five-hour break is over. The quote-unquote original crew returns to the cockpit. There was start of turbulence as they were reaching Los Angeles, so the autopilot was struggling a little bit. The autopilot started to reduce the thrust of all four engines and then it started to return it back to normal. As I said, the autopilot was struggling due to the turbulence. However, as the engine's thrust returned back to normal, engine number four's thrust was weak and low. Flight engineer well decided to try and increase the thrust of the engine, but he was unsuccessful. So he tried again, but the crew concluded that the engine had flamed out. So the crew started to prepare to do the flame out checklist. The crew decided to request a new altitude from the air traffic controller because at the altitude that they were at, which is 41,000 feet or 12,497 meters, they were unable to restart the engine. The required altitude for a successful restart, the airplane needed to be at 30,000 feet or 9,144 meters. The air traffic controller responded by saying, please stand by. Regardless of the altitude, the flight engineer tries to restart the engine but he is unsuccessful. The plane starts to slow down due to a lack of thrust, which for me is kind of confusing because the other engines as i had read kind of returned back to normal in terms of their thrust so that's confusing for me but i'm going to talk about that later on so the reason why it's dangerous for an airplane to lose thrust whilst in the sky is because as the airplane slows down and the nose of the plane starts going up the airplane can stall and eventually fall from the sky which is incredibly not the thing that an airplane is supposed to do. So Captain Ho decided to disengage the autopilot in order to manually fly the airplane. To try and increase the speed, Captain Ho decides to push the nose of the aircraft down in order to gain speed. At the same time this is happening, the aircraft starts to bank to the right and First Officer Chang makes the captain aware that the airplane is banking to the right. He says, we're banking right. 
Captain Ho does not respond as he is preoccupied with increasing the speed of the aircraft. In the cabin, it is incredibly chaotic as hell because many people are getting injured by the falling luggage and they're essentially falling over. Back in the cockpit, the airplane starts to dive and bank to the right. Now Captain Ho starts to panic because he cannot see the horizon. Please try and remember that the flight was within the clouds. It was very dark as it was the early hours of the morning and the horizon is not necessarily visible whilst an aeroplane is still in the clouds. So the next best thing that a pilot should use if they cannot see the horizon is to look at the attitude director indicator or ADR. The ADI is an instrument that provides an artificial horizon that pilots use and refer to when the real or natural horizon is unavailable. So the airplane at this point, please try and remember that it was in a dive still. And because of the dive, it created G-forces in the aircraft. The G-forces resulted in the ADI tumbling slash going around and around and around and therefore becomes unreadable. The aeroplane is rolling rightward at the moment. Flight engineer Well tries to restart the engine, but he is unsuccessful yet again due to the G-forces. The engine, I mean engine number 4. Dynasty 006 starts to dive further and they emerge out of the clouds. The ocean is visible at this point. All four engines start to fail, basically. Captain Ho starts to pull up and the aeroplane starts to respond. The aeroplane starts to get out of the dive, however, the flight is not out of danger yet. The crew starts to try and restart all of their engines and as they were doing that, the aeroplane started to dive yet again. The airspeed increases yet again. The aircraft controller tries to contact flight 006 but is unsuccessful. The landing gear cover blows off of the aeroplane and this indicates that the aeroplane was going fast as hell and there were a ton of g-forces that it was experiencing. Since the Pacific Ocean could be seen, the captain starts to see the horizon and as a result he decides to pull up. Three out of the four engines start to respond and regain thrust as the captain is getting out of the dive. Engine number four is the only engine that does not turn on. As a result, for the final time, flight engineer Well decides to try and restart engine number four and it starts to respond. Now, even though everything seemed to be normal yet again, the crew decides to contact air traffic control and request an emergency landing. The air traffic controller tells the crew that they are clear to descend at pilot's discretion. As they are reaching the airport, aka San Francisco International Airport and not Los Angeles International Airport, the crew then realizes that their rear elevators were ripped off during the dive and as a result they concluded that they had to land using engine thrust. So the crew starts to manually control the engines and as a result reduce the speed of the aeroplane enough that they land safely at San Francisco International Airport. Luckily no one and I mean no one died during this flight and the passengers only suffered minor and some more serious injuries. You can confidently say that everyone on board has survived the crash. Now, for me personally, I wouldn't necessarily call this a crash because there wasn't really a crash. We'll just call it a disaster or an incident from now on. So this incident was investigated by none other than the National Transportation Safety Board of the United States of America. The crash site. So as I mentioned, the flight, the airplane, it landed safely. So there wasn't necessarily a crash site. However, the airplane was taxied out of or like yeah out of the runway so that more investigation could be done so this is what they found the left outboard ailerons upper surface panel was broken and the trailing edge wedge was cracked in several places now when it comes to the empennage if you don't know what that is it is the entire tail section of the aircraft which includes the horizontal and vertical stabilizers the rudder and the elevator 
and I quote, the major damage to the empennage was limited to the auxiliary power unit or APU compartment, the horizontal stabilizers and elevators. The APU had separated from its mounts and was resting on the two lower tail cone access doors. The forward side of the APU fire bulkhead appeared to be deflected forward in the area adjacent to the two lower attachment fittings and the two lower support rods had bulkhead. In the area of the APU, there were several punctures in an outward direction on both sides of the tail cone. A large part of the left horizontal stabilizer had separated from the remainder of the stabilizer. The separated portion which began at the outboard tip of the stabilizer was about 10 to 11 feet long and included the entire left outboard elevator. The hydraulic lines from number one hydraulic system to the left outboard elevator actuator were severed near the actuator. Now it comes to the right horizontal stabilizer. The right horizontal stabilizer incurred a similar separation. The separated portion included the entire tip of the stabilizer. However, beginning about five feet inboard of the tip, the separation moved directly AFT to the area of the rear spar and then inboard an additional five or six feet along the forward edge of the box beam area. The separated portion of the stabilizer included the outboard three quarters of the outboard right elevator. The hydraulic lines to the outboard elevator actuator remained intact. I know that was a lot of technical stuff, but just know that the damage to the aircraft was caused by the G-forces it experienced due to the dive. The medical and pathological information, and I quote, except for the one cabin crew member admitted to a hospital after landing, medical examinations of the flight and cabin crew members were not conducted after the accident, nor was toxicological testing of the flight crew performed, end quote. I mean, it's incredibly awesome that no one died due to this event. Like, we just never hear that everyone on board has survived an event as intense as this. However, for me, it's kind of weird that a toxicology test wasn't done on the pilots in the event that they were under the influence. I'm not saying that they were, but what if they were and they did not do this testing on them? It's kind of suspicious, but it's, it's, it's okay. The meteorological information, and I quote, the examination of the dispatch package showed that the weather information provided to the flight crew of Flight 006 included the forecast winds aloft in route, a high level significant weather prognostic map, 200 and 300 millibar prognostic maps, and the TFORS or International Terminal Forecast for Los Angeles, San Francisco, and Oakland, end quote. So basically, this is just saying that the crew had all of the meteorological information that they knew. they knew or they were supposed to know that there was going to be turbulence as they were entering Los Angeles, San Francisco, Oakland, California area. And that it shouldn't have come as a surprise that that happened. The weather didn't cause the crash in case you were wondering. So the flight data record our FDR information. The examination of the FDR readout disclosed a number of areas where data was lost. These data losses were the result of the vibration and the sustained vertical acceleration forces or G's exerted on the recorder during descent. End quote. So essentially the flight data recorder didn't record a lot due to the G forces that the crew and that the airplane experienced during the dives but now it's time for the tests and the research because i think you're gonna find that more interesting because it shocked me too so after the crash engine number four was removed and it was tested because the first thing that the investigators went to was oh yeah there was this part that was recently repaired what if it wasn't repaired properly turns out the engine was fixed properly before the flight took place and basically the engine didn't cause this disaster. Turns out the reasons as to why the engine stopped working at 41,000 feet was because of the fact that the engine was a hung engine. This is a situation where the engine RPM does not accelerate properly to idle and is instead stuck. That's why the engine didn't go past a specific speed. 
and that is why the engine essentially was weak and the thrust was low was because it was a hung engine so the investigators were now dumbfounded what is going on so then they decided to go and investigate the other engines because the pilot said that after the second dive or like after the other dive whatever the other engines stopped working and they were reduced thrust so the investigators wanted to examine those other engines and the investigators discovered that the engines did not flame out whatsoever and there are supporting reasons as to why this didn't this flame out didn't happen is because and i quote number one the cabin pressurization did not drop to the point that passenger oxygen masks were deployed number two the number four generator breaker had opened when the number four engine was shut down had the other three engines flamed out their three generators would have tripped and the essential ac bus would have lost power had that happened the fdr would have ceased operating and in addition the instrument warning flag would have appeared neither of these events occurred number three the engine low oil pressure warnings did not illuminate end quote so now it's kind of confusing as to what is going on because the pilots gave this whole story this whole situation of basically saying oh the engines they stopped working they flamed out so that's what we were trying to do but here is proof saying that that didn't happen I know stay with me because essentially the investigators debunked the crew's entire story because furthermore the crew said that their attitude director indicators or ADIs were not working right and that they were tumbling back and forth due to the g-forces well turns out the ADIs were tested and they were working perfectly so what did the pilots see human performance so the relief crew was put on board because the flight was 11 hours as i had mentioned before and basically the original crew was meant to rest within the five hours that they had in order to you know regain their energy and actually do their jobs properly in terms of landing the plane safely at la so before this flight took place we're going to focus on the captain a little bit because the captain's week was incredibly busy and i quote the captain had spent five days in jeddah saudi arabia before returning to taipei on february 14 1985. taipei is five hours ahead of jeddah time he was off duty on february 15th on february 16th he flew a two hour 30 minute flight to tokyo japan returning to taipei a three hour flight on february 17th according to the captain during the nights of february 14th through february 17th he went to sleep between nine o'clock to 10 o'clock p.m. Taipei time and awoke about 7 a.m. to 8 a.m. On February 18th, he flew a round trip to Nagoya, Japan and was off duty 15 hours and 20 minutes before reporting for duty on February 19th, end quote. This man was incredibly busy, was very busy and as much as he said that, oh yeah, I had uh, slept from 9 o'clock to 8 o'clock that type of stuff we're not really sure that he rested for that amount of time and please try to remember that this original crew is in charge of takeoff climb and part of the flight so as much as the captain you know he had to do his job all around the world and that type of stuff that is why the five hour rest period was there because it would give the crew the opportunity to rest during the flight so this is what happened during the flight and i quote the captain was off duty five hours during the flight and returned to duty about two hours before the accident during his rest period the captain slept about two hours in the bunk located in the rear of the cockpit the first officer was off duty about three hours during the flight and returned to duty about three hours before the accident the flight engineer was off duty about five hours and returned to duty about two hours before the accident the first officers and flight engineers activities during the rest periods were not established end quote 
so for me this little snippet into the flight kind of implies that they were not resting but why were they not resting because that is why the five hour period is there so that they can rest enough and then they can go and do their jobs properly well i'll tell you that soon but before we do that i have to first go through the china airlines procedures when it comes to cockpit management so it says and i quote the china airlines boeing 747 sp airplane operating manual aom emergency procedure section states in part that and i quote the captain will take necessary action to establish and or maintain control of the airplane and call for the appropriate checklist end quote thus according to the flight training chief and operations director in the event of an unscheduled loss of engine thrust abnormal engine response to throttle movements or failure of the engine to respond to throttle inputs the captain while primarily directing his attention to flying the airplane could have directed the first officer and flight engineer to deal with the tasks involved with either restoring full engine performance or shutting down and restarting the engine end quote now for me that whole thing is just very worrying and it's unjust to just put so much pressure on just one person i mean yes that person is a captain and they are supposed to know what's going on and that type of stuff but you must also remember that during that whole situation the captain was focusing on the speed on how to save the airplane from you know diving into the ground he was also focusing on the speed and now a first officer is telling him that oh yeah we are backing to the right oh yeah speed da -da 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 -da. that type of stuff i think that is incredibly unjust to put one person as the sole responsibility of such a chaotic event like that i mean yeah we don't want to play the blame game but i'll tell you what i think at the end but i think this explains as to why there was so much chaos in the cockpit because the one person who was responsible for telling other people what to do was focusing on another thing like the whole cockpit in itself wasn't working in unison and they were just trying to do different things in order to save the airplane all right so yes i did say that we're gonna go back to the whole uh why when they're resting i just need to get through this first because i think it's also important is that the g-forces that the crew experienced during uh, the several dives that they had might have caused spatial disorientation if you do not know, spatial disorientation according to skybrary.aero is the inability of a pilot to correctly interpret aircraft altitude, altitude or airspeed in relation to the earth or other points of reference. End quote. Now, this I can believe did happen because as I'd mentioned during the whole flight part of this episode, the captain was saying that he could not see the horizon. He was also saying that the ADIs were spinning and they were tumbling. That is essentially spatial disorientation. He didn't trust what he saw with the ADI and he was basically looking for the quote unquote natural horizon which he could not see because the aeroplane was still in the clouds. And only after the aeroplane left the clouds basically and was nearing the pacific ocean that's when he could see the quote-unquote natural horizon and have a reference of like oh yeah the sky is here it's up it's up so i need to pull up overall it's a scary phenomenon that is still being researched till this day and it's a very scary situation for a person to be under now i'm not saying that it caused this crash but this phenomena has caused other crashes such as john f kennedy jr's plane crash which probably will be a patreon exclusive but overall i just want to say that in my opinion special disorientation did kind of put its hand in as to the cause of this incident so the part that you're waiting for fatigue and monotony so if you don't know monotony is a lack of variety and interest or tedious repetition and routine essentially it's when um 
maybe I should make it a little bit more personal for you. It's kind of like when you wake up and you have to like go to school or go to work, university, whatever. You come back, uh, you, you bath, you shower, you go cook, you eat, you watch TV, you go to sleep. And you do that every day, every day, every day, every day. Over time, it gets boring and you don't want to do it anymore. So that's basically monotony. So tests were done on how fatigue and general monotony affected the way in which pilots do their jobs. Now going back to the pilots or just being a pilot in general, being a pilot I think is very exciting but it's also tiring. Yes, they're going through different locations every day, every hour and they're just seeing new things and that type of stuff. And when you're used to that certain lifestyle of like, oh yeah, every day like today, I'm in Tokyo. Tomorrow I'm in Los Angeles. The next day I'm in Johannesburg. That type of stuff. And then out of nowhere, uh, someone says, oh yeah, after your Johannesburg trip, you kind of gonna need to sit at home for the next couple of weeks that becomes a little bit of like a foreign thing to you because you're so used to being somewhere or like doing something every time so monotony plays a huge part in this case so the pilots were told that they needed to rest for five hours during this flight but all of them returned early instead of resting now for me I think resting can be seen as a form of monotony because as I mentioned when you to doing something all the time and someone just tells you to stop and just relax you genuinely cannot do it it's just like me someone telling me oh yeah I'm recording podcast episodes every week and then I must just stop and do nothing it's weird isn't it so monotony definitely a red flag to say the most so the findings Who would have thought that we've gotten here after so many things i've been talking about here so number one the flight crew was properly certificated and qualified number two the changing air speeds encountered by flight 006 and the resulted compensating throttle adjustments were caused by wind speed variations number three the number four engine did not flame out but hung at about 1.0 epr number four during his attempt to recover the number four engine the flight engineer did not close the bleed air valve switch before advancing the number four throttle number five the other three engines did not lose thrust nor did they flame out number six the captain did not disengage the autopilot in a timely manner after thrust was lost on the number four engine the autopilot effectively masked the approaching onset of the loss of control of the airplane Number seven, the captain was distracted from his flight monitoring duties by his participation with the flight engineer in the evaluation of the number four engine malfunction. Number eight, with the exception of the loss of thrust on the number four engine, no other airplane malfunction affected the performance of the airplane. The loss of thrust on the number four engine did not contribute to the accident. Number nine, the captain was also distracted by his attempts to arrest the airplane's decreasing speed and this also contributed to his failure to detect the airplane's increasing bank angle. Number 10. The damage to the airplane was a result of the acceleration forces and the high speeds that had occurred during the upset and recovery maneuvers. So it's essentially pilot error. There's nothing else to it. But if you have been listening to this podcast for a long time, you know that we have to cement this with a probable cause. And I quote, The National Transportation Safety Board determines that the probable cause of this accident was the captain's preoccupation with an in-flight malfunction and his failure to monitor properly the airplane's flight instruments, which resulted in his losing control of the airplane. Contributing to the accident was the captain's over-reliance on the autopilot after the loss of thrust on the number four engine, aka pilot error. So the recommendations. So the recommendations set up by the NTSB is that there are no recommendations because the case of flight 006 wasn't caused by something that could be fixed within a person. Like, how do I say this? For example, if 
the airplane was messed up or it malfunctioned and it was maintenance error you can of course fix the airplane if it was weather then you can create systems in order to combat the weather however when it's something within just human nature like special disorientation and just poor judgment it can't be fixed by an investigator it cannot be fixed by a set of rules so these two factors are not controlled as they are within a person and they basically do not have a solution so overall spatial disorientation is incredibly scary i have not experienced it but i think as a pilot in that situation where it's stress like a ton of stress and then the airplane is doing something that you were not trained on how to deal with you are in the clouds so you cannot see the horizon you don't even trust the adi it's just a whole recipe for disaster and it's actually quite surprising that the pilots essentially got out of that situation personally when i first saw like a summary of this um incident almost said crash this incident i genuinely thought that a person or like at least the whole passengers and flight attendants and the crew had died in this crash because it does not make any sense that every single one of the people survived just to conclude i'm just glad that this is also did not end in a literal crash and that everyone was safe that is the end of today's episode. I know it has been a long one. Let me know if you like these long episodes. Because I think they are fun. Don't forget to rate us 5 stars on the podcast platform that you're listening to us on. Um, let me know your thoughts either on Instagram, on Twitter, or under the podcast. In terms of like Spotify Q&As, that type of stuff. Um, thank you so much for listening. Once again, don't forget to check out our Patreon. And uh, buy me a coffee if you're feeling generous. Um, and I'll catch you in the next one. Cheers.